fixed. I'm Jim. welcome and I'm glad to see all of these faces here today and um, if you'll bring your bulletin home and stick it on the refrigerator for these announcements um, the, the one I do want to uh, really announce is that the poinsettia forms are in there and it's closer to Christmas than we like to think because you know it's like six weeks away or something eight something like that anyway um, Trunk or Treat is happening on Sunday, October 30th from 4 to 6.30, or 4.30 to 6 here in our parking lot. And we do have a sign-up sheet outside on the table. There's also a sign-up genius that Leslie has sent out. Um, we really want your participation. This is a way not for us just to fellowship and have fun together as Trinity, but to also help um, get the word of Christ out there and um, into our community and not just within the walls of Trinity. Let's spread our wings. And then following that, we also have drive through prayer this coming Tuesday, and that's another way to serve our community. It's not hard. It takes lots of smiles, waving hands, and holding up a sign, and we have a prayer tent. And the last two times that we've done this, we've had upwards of 11 people stopping by for prayer. And that's a wonderful thing, and it's a sad thing all wrapped up together. So um, come out and join that way. It's a very easy way to serve our community, a very easy way to be in evangelism for our Lord. So show up and have some fun and do something for our community. Don't forget we have lots of Bible studies during the week, uh, men's and a women's Bible study on Wednesday night, a women's Bible study on uh, Monday morning, and a co-ed Bible study on Tuesday morning. That leads me to the next thing is that Leslie and I will... Um, 
so to speak, be leading prayer on Mondays and Tuesdays after Bible studies uh, times here in the sanctuary. That's about 11.30, 11.45 on Mondays, and um, right about 11 on Tuesdays. Um, just a chance to get together and pray for our church, for our nation, for everything. We need to be on our knees, and I think that that, that will give people an opportunity to do that as well. Um, Yes. Uh, okay. Okay, so maybe um, 11.30ish instead of 11. So anybody come, just pray. Sit in the seat and pray. Come to the altar and gaze on our beautiful cross. Um, and it's open for everybody. For everybody. We would love to have you here. Um, Monday night is UMW at 6.30. It will be here at the church. Um, just take these home and put them on your calendar at home or on your refrigerators where all my stuff like this is. And um, come and be with us anytime that you can. Um, I'd like to say a short prayer as we get started this morning. Um, if you'll bow your heads with me, please. Lord, you have promised us that we're two or more together you are there. We ask for your presence this morning. We ask you to be with us as we go through the week. We ask you to love us. We know that you do and that our love for you in return is mighty. We ask for your leadership. We ask for your mercy and compassion. We ask for you to lead us down the right road, the way that we should go. Teach us to love one another as you have always loved us. And in your name we always pray. Amen. And um, this is not in our bulletin, but as I said this morning, we're going to do it anyway. We have a um, stewardship, stewardship moment, and Collins Pratt will give that to us. As you know, October is usually stewardship month, so we're going to get started with that as Collins come up, comes up and gives us his message. <coughs> All right, morning everyone. Morning. All right, um, once again, my name is Collins Pratt. I'm gonna be doing the first stewardship message. Uh, we'll be having three of these messages um, throughout the next roughly month or so. And then at the end, um, everyone will have their pledge cards, whether they're provided the day of or uh, in the mail for you to bring and turn in at the end. Uh, so for me, I was gonna talk about why stewardship is important to me. Uh, growing up, uh, the church I attended, they um, during the offering period, they would say, all things come from thee, O Lord, and of thy own have we given thee. And that resonated a lot with me and made me think, you know, everything comes from God and what we give back to him is just what he's already given to us. So if we didn't have anything, we couldn't give anything back, but very thankful for everything he has given to me for me to give back. Um, from Proverbs 3, 9 through 10, it talks about honoring the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of all produce. And then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Uh, talks about mentioning first fruits from the standpoint, you know, you give to the Lord, at least for us, for my wife and for me, we give to the Lord the first of what we have before we worry about hey, paying bills, what we're gonna eat, things of that nature, and then ideally giving just scraps to the Lord because the Lord does a lot better uh, than that for me. Growing up, I was always taught to give 10% to tithe. Uh, for some folks, it varies. Some folks give what they're comfortable with. I like to use the tithing aspect as just kind of a starting point. And it was something I did before I was married, um, something I talked to my wife about before we got married, and something we've done together since we've been married. Uh, and it's something that I'm very comfortable with. And on top of that, still put a little extra in the plate as a offering. That was one thing my dad always taught me is, hey, you know, even though you give your tithe, you put a little extra as offering. And I try to pass that along to my kids. So my oldest son right now, he gets $10 a week and we teach him to keep a little ledger. And from his ledger, $5 is gonna go to savings, you get $4 for spending and your $1, your 10%, that goes to church. And 
it was something I know it meant a lot for me, something I still do today, what my father taught me and, or my dad taught me. And it's something I hope I instill in my kids now and they can move forward with it. Um, and growing up, I guess when I got to college, I started reading the Bible more. The Old Testament was it really resonated with me. I think it's, you know, you hear all the stories as a kid. There's a lot more stories come out of the Old Testament. And you read it and you see these stories and you see how they're a little different than just the happy-go-lucky part. Um, but in Leviticus 27.30, um, they talk about a tenth of the produce of the land. Um, whatever grain or fruit is the Lord's and is holy. So um, you know, a lot of things from the Old Testament, you may not take it literal, but certain aspects, I think it's a good starting point, um, and you can kind of go from there. And another thing why I like to give, it's going to the church. The church is doing the Lord's work. So that's just something I've always enjoyed to take give and just make sure the Lord's work is being done. So that's my stewardship message for the morning. Thank you all. Um, we have two new people with us this morning that I wanted to um, sort of introduce. Um, first, we have um, Reverend Jim Contrell, who will be with us for the next three weeks. Um, and we also have um, David Washington, who is um, our new tech guy that is replacing Matt Cosby. I am so glad you're here. <laughs> so if you'll give them a welcome when you get a chance, maybe at the end of service, that would be great. Now if you all stand and um, greet each other this morning.
We're so glad you're here today worshiping with us. If you're visiting, I want you to know that you have entered the most friendly Christ in the church within the distance of your home, regardless of where you are. We are glad that you're here today, and I'm just kind of filling in a little bit while we switch around up here. But if you'd like, you can stand and join with us as we sing a couple of praise songs. Would you stand?
to come forward.
conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning, you guys. How are you? How many of you guys have ever played a new game? I was going to say, I know the children's ministry started playing a new game, I don't know, back in April, I think it was, called Otrio. You can put your hands down. Do y'all remember when we first started playing Otrio? Well, it was a long time ago. I know, like six months ago. It was a long time ago. But Otria, when we first started playing it, we had to read through the rules, didn't we? We had to learn how to play it. Each person gets a color, and then you can do tic-tac-toe in so many different ways on the board, can't you? You can do the, the little pieces, you can do the middle pieces, the big pieces, or you can do a big, middle, little, or a little, middle, big. Yeah, you could do it up and down or diagonal. But there's lots of rules to that game. So we had to review them and go over them, didn't we? Now, so far I haven't noticed yet with Otrio, but I have noticed with some other games, sometimes we start arguing over what the rule is. Have you guys ever seen anything like that? I didn't do that. That's not how it goes. I want to do it this way. That's not right. I love the look you're giving me, Ellie Kate. You've never had a game where that's happened? Well, just wait. It'll happen. I promise you. There will be a day where you're not going to agree with somebody's rule or maybe the way they interpreted a rule or maybe the way their parents to told them a rule or something. And there's going to be an argument. How many of you guys have ever argued with your brothers or sisters if you have one? Yep, I have one of those little brothers, who I can't call him a little brother anymore because he's six foot one. He's about that much taller than I am, but he is my younger brother. But I remember arguing with him all the time. Well, in today's Bible story, and we're going to go back and actually read the verses in a few minutes, but Jesus is asked a question by um, a lawyer, basically. He's, he's trying to trick Jesus, and he says, hey, which one of the commandments that you've given us is the most important? And Jesus responds with, first, love God above everything else. And the second one is love your neighbor as you would love yourself. Hmm. So we were given two rules there to follow. Now those two rules, should we argue about them? They're pretty, they're pretty solid rules. But you know, here's the hard thing. Sometimes we put something besides God first. It might be money. It might be football. It might be baseball. Oh, it might be our tablet. That was an, an awesome answer. But we may put our TV or our tablet before God. But then the second rule says we're supposed to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Sometimes you might hear that sort of called the golden rule. Do unto others as you would want them to do to you, to be treated, how you want to be treated. And that rule is sometimes even harder because the reality is people sometimes get on our nerve, right? Sometimes they say things we don't agree with. 
Sometimes they don't understand stuff like we think we understand it. But the bottom line is we are supposed to love them, even if they're different than us, even if we don't agree with them, even if maybe they're flat out wrong. We still, what are we supposed to do? We're still supposed to love them. And your neighbors, yes, you're exactly right. We're supposed to love everybody, okay? Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for bringing this amazing group of kids with us today. As we learn the two most important commandments, to put God first and above everything, and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. In your most awesome and holy name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, 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 go to the door and wait for Miss Ellen. While the choir is wandering down, I'm just going to take a second, and uh, Sharon's already introduced Jim, but I'm just going to say another word or two about him. Jim has been a United Methodist pastor here in, in the conference for about years, uh, and he's now retired. I don't know exactly how many years, Jim. 46. 46? Just a newcomer. Just a newcomer. But he is filling in today and three additional Sundays for our pastor, Ashley who is on a brief sabbatical for four weeks, and we appreciate Jim coming and doing that. And Jim, we welcome you to the pulpit. Thank you very much. 
I remember one time I was in, uh, when I was in a uh, little bitty three-point circuit over in East Georgia in the Augusta District, I was on a Tignal Charge, and there was a, there was a family, the Smith family, who, who, who owned a pig farm. And they used to, I was single then. My wife Holly and I hadn't gotten married yet. They used to invite me out there a lot to eat with them because they felt sorry for having a single preacher who didn't cook that well. And um, they had two sons. Their youngest son was the most tenderhearted of anybody I, I guess I've ever met. And he used to he used to take the runts of the litters. Those of you born in the country know that every sow has a whole bunch of little piglets, and one of them usually is smaller than the other, sometimes two. But he would take the smallest one, the runt, and raise it inside the house. And it became a pet, and it was, the pigs are very smart. I mean, I don't know how they, they might look to you, but they're very, very intelligent animals. And this little pig, for some reason or another, came right over and sat down on my feet. And I uh, didn't say much. I just kind of shooed it away. And uh, after a few minutes, it came back and sat down right in the middle of my feet again. And I, at that point, I said to my uh, host, to George, I said, you know, George, I think this little pig of yours might, uh, might like me. He said, it's sitting right here on my feet. He said, well, I'm not sure he likes you or not. Uh, he, he may just be a little jealous. You know, you're eating out of his plate. <laughs> so I thank you for that introduction, but I've had a few and not all of them. <clears throat> Some, I always, every time I get a nice introduction, I always remember when I uh, ate out of that pig's plate. And so... In any event, I'm glad that you're here today, and I'm happy to be with you for the next several Sundays. Would you join me as we pray? Gracious Lord, help us to turn our eyes upon you. Help us to look full in your wonderful face so that the light of eternity will shine through us and that we will be filled with grace, the grace of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you as we come to you this morning in prayer. We come to you with hearts full of happiness and joy, goodness and grace. We come to you with hearts that are troubled and concerned and confused. We come to you because we want your light of grace to shine through us. And we want to look into your wonderful face and to experience the goodness which is you. Lord, no matter what is going on inside our hearts and inside our lives today, we give it all to you. Because we know that you can do something special and make something special of everything that we have and everything that we are. Lord, we come today confessing that we have not been all you've called us to be. There have been times when we've failed to be your witnesses. There have been times when we have looked away from your face and have looked toward other things. And we, remit, we repent of those times. And we admit that you are God and the only thing that can forgive us. So we ask for your forgiveness, knowing that you are a God of grace and mercy who is quick to forgive all of your children who love you and call upon you and ask for your forgiveness. So Lord... We confess before you and before one another that we have not been all that we can be. And we pray that you'll forgive us. And as your forgiven children, O oh God, we pray that you'll send us from this place today renewed and revived and encouraged by your love and by your grace. Help us everywhere we go and everywhere we are to radiate your light so that others may look into your wonderful face and see your amazing grace. We pray this and all of our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together and to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Forgive us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. Our scripture this morning is from Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be, Thanks to, God. be to God. Thank you very much, Sharon. I appreciate your help today, and I appreciate your kindness in welcoming me, along with uh, Leslie's kindness in welcoming me this morning. I want you to uh, join me as we uh, pray and ask God to bless us. Gracious Lord, may the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, I'm only going to be here for the next uh, four Sundays. And so uh, I, I didn't want to waste that much of your time uh, in helping you to get to know me because the fact of the matter is we won't have a lot of time to get to know each other. So I thought I would just short circuit that process a little bit today by giving you what I think, what I believe, so that you'll know at least what you have uh, for the next uh, few weeks uh, and you'll know exactly what I think and what I believe. First thing I wanted to say is I believe that God is present in Trinitarian form. I believe that God exists in three persons. God is known by many names. Heavenly Father, Creator, I Am, and so many other names that all of us have uh, placed upon God. God is also known as the Son, the, cre the, the, the Redeemer. Uh, the Jesus Christ, the Savior, all the other names that we give to God's saving work. God is also Holy Spirit, Comforter, re the Guide, the, the Revealer, all of those kinds of things that we say God is that inspires us to be all that God has saved us to be. Now, the Trinity is still a mystery, and it should be. It always will be. The, tr the Trinity, I can only begin to explain. I cannot explain it completely, and neither can anyone else. And that's all right. What I do know, what I do believe, is that even though I don't know everything about God and never will, as much as I understand about God, I believe that God is in three persons. God is one nature, and that God loves us all, every single one of us, more than any of us can ever know. I believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. I know that you do too. I know that most of us believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. And for those who don't, well, God bless them. I'm sorry for them. They've still got a lot to learn. But everybody that I know believes in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, and that is a blessing. Now, I don't know how it happened. I don't know how God made it happen, but I absolutely believe that God can and God did and that Jesus Christ came among us as the firstborn of virgin. Is that the most important thing in my theological uh, ideas? No, it is not, but it is absolutely one of them. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and that he is the Savior of all who will call upon his name in faith. I believe that. 
I believe that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the, gra- from the death, from the grave, and was given new life. And because of that new life that Christ inhabits, we have the promise of everlasting life with God. Everyone who calls upon his name in faith has everlasting life because he was physically raised from death. I believe that the Holy Spirit is very much with us and always continues to comfort us, to bless us, to guide us, to reveal to us, to challenge us, to enlighten us, at times to warn us, and always to encourage and inspire us. I believe that the truth about God and the truth about faith can be found in the Bible, in Scripture. I believe that the Bible has authority for every single one of us. The questions that we face in our denomination today are not about the authority of the Bible. People on both sides of the argument believe that the Bible is authoritative. It's a matter that the people on both sides of the argument interpret that scripture differently. Now, I don't know who's right and who's wrong. That's not up to me. But I do know that it happens that way and that even people on the other side of whatever argument we're on still believe that scripture is authoritative. I believe that the Bible is interpreted differently because I have seen it interpreted differently. I have been a voting delegate for the last five general conferences. I've been there. I've seen it happen. I know how people turn from relying on Holy Scripture and relying on the Holy Spirit in one moment and arguing and fighting and wanting to get what they want, what they believe is right, the very next. I've seen it. I know it happens. I also know that as somebody who's now over 70 years old, I don't experience Holy Scripture in the same way today as I did when I first began when I was in my 20s. Not to say that the Bible says anything different. It doesn't. What it says is that I'm different. What it says is that I can now see the richness and the fullness and the depth of Scripture today in ways that I could never see when I was in my 20s. I know that I interpret Scripture and see more in Scripture today than I did then. And that's fine. That's a wonderful blessing uh, to me. I also realize, having been a member of various mission teams to Central and South America and to Africa and to Europe and other different places around the world, that different people in different places interpret Scripture differently than I do. And that's all right, because we still believe in Jesus Christ as Savior. We still believe in God as Creator. We still believe in the Holy Spirit. We just come at it a little bit differently. I don't always agree with everybody. Don't have to. Because I can accept the fact that God has told me what I need to know, and that's more than enough. Now, I need to point out that while I absolutely believe in and count Scripture as being authoritative, while I absolutely believe that Scripture has within it literal truth, I am not a biblical literalist when it comes to interpretation. I am not, and I never will be, because there are, to me, some portions of Scripture that are allegorical, and I respect that. For examples, I would cite the parables of the New Testament as being wonderful allegories. Also, some of the material related to the prophets and the end-time predictions in both the Old and the New Testaments are allegorical in nature, just like some parts of the creation story are allegorical in nature. I'm not saying that any of these is less important, not at all. I'm just saying that if we want to treat them honestly, and if we want to treat them in the way that they were written, we have to treat them as allegories and look for the literal truth that's hidden within that allegory that we have before us. They're wonderful passages, believe me, but they're not to be taken literally like some of the other aspects of Scripture are. I also want to say that I am not saved by Scripture. I repeat that. I am not saved by the Bible. I am saved through grace in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord. 
That means the Bible is certainly important, absolutely important. I don't have any question about the importance of Scripture. But Scripture didn't save my soul. Jesus does. Jesus has saved it, saves it today, saves it to the uttermost, and will save it tomorrow. That's Wesleyan. You can look up John Wesley and see him say the same thing. Every relationship that I have, every understanding that I have of Scripture, I have is first based on my relationship with you and especially with God through faith and through grace as a saved person in Jesus Christ. I believe that the Holy Spirit is alive and well in the church. But since the church is made up of sinners like you and like me, we're not perfect. We will sometimes make mistakes. But guess what? The Holy Spirit does not make mistakes. The Holy Spirit gets it right. The problem is sometimes we prefer to follow our own beliefs and our own ideas. Sometimes we'd rather go in our own tendencies and directions rather than follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we think we know what is right. Sometimes we think we know what is best. and Sometimes we do, but many times we don't. The Holy Spirit always does. The Holy Spirit will guide us into an understanding of what God wants for us and where God wants us to be. I believe that. I admit freely and fully that I don't always know what is best for our denomination. I don't always know where we in the United Methodist Church need to go. But I believe the Holy Spirit does. I absolutely believe that the Holy Spirit knows where we need to be, what we need to be, and who we need to be. And I believe our focus should be on the guidance of that Holy Spirit, on where it leads us, and not on where we want to go ourselves. Just to give you a little insight, I was in St. Louis, and we spent the very first day of General Conference in St. Louis in prayer focusing on the Holy Spirit. I was so encouraged. I was so excited because I believed that I could sense a brand new direction and that God was going to lead us and guide us and help us. But the very next morning of the second day we got there, battle lines were drawn, people split off into sides and they began to fight and argue and they acted like they'd never heard of the Holy Spirit. I was crushed. I was disappointed because I believe the only way we're ever going to find out where we need to be as a denomination is to follow the guidance of God's Holy Spirit. I'll tell you that I'm a Wesleyan Christian. I believe in our Wesleyan way of understanding. For example, providence. I do not believe that we are predestined for heaven or for hell. I'm convinced that, and it's very tragic, I understand that, but I do believe that some people will resist grace, that grace is not resistible, and that sometimes people will also turn their backs on their faith. It always breaks my heart, but I know that people can do that. I say that to let you know that I am not a tulip Christian. I am not a Calvinist Christian. I am a Wesleyan Methodist Christian. I do not want anyone to think that I think any one is better than the other, but I want you to know that I know who I am. And I want you to know who you are as well. You don't have to believe exactly like I do. You absolutely do not. But be certain that if you want to call yourself a Wesleyan Christian, you need to know what a Wesleyan Christian is before you start calling yourself one. I'm also a Methodist centrist. I'm not a progressive and I am not a conservative, and I will not let anybody pigeonhole me into those boxes. I am a centrist. I believe in the Wesleyan Methodist way of doing things from the center. I believe in John Wesley's uh, think and let think. I believe in John Wesley's, if your heart is his mind, give me your hand. Even though we may not think alike, let us love alike. 
I think that's very important for all of us. Now, sometimes, like in missional priorities, for example, I may be a little bit left of center. I don't deny that. I, I would not deny for one second that I'm, a, that I'm not a, a study in contrast and contradiction because sometimes it seems that way. I am not consistent in that respect. For example, I believe we ought to do whatever we can do in whatever ways we can do it to make certain that everyone, everyone, no exceptions, hears the saving message of Jesus Christ, the gospel good news. Everybody needs to hear that. If a judgment is to be made of another's worthiness or righteousness, it's not my judgment to make. That is up to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Jesus told us not to judge. My responsibility is to tell people about Jesus and live for Jesus Christ. And if Christ wants to do something differently, that's up to him, not me. There are other times like some financial priorities that I may be a little bit to the right of center. For example, I don't think it's right for us to spend more money than we can reasonably expect to receive. I don't think it's right for us to go out and, and, and raid uh, funds that are, that are designed for some other kind of use, designated for this or that or the other. I don't think it's right for us to put in new carpet or paint a wall or do something else, buy something that we want but don't necessarily need just because we think we should. So I'm perhaps a bit more conservative in that respect. And again, I take full responsibility, but I don't expect you to be like me, not at all. But I want you to know who I am so that you'll know exactly why I do what I do if I ever do something that you question. As regards our biblical text this morning, I absolutely believe that we are to love God with all our mind, all our heart, all our soul, absolutely all the time. God is and should be at the very center of everything that we are and everything that we do all the time. I don't think any of us would disagree with this principle, but sometimes we have a hard time living it out. Sometimes we forget there are situations when we don't make any room in our hearts and our souls and our minds for God, and we decide to go off and be the, the captains of our own fates. Then we decide we're going to do things exactly the way we want to do it and refuse to accept the loving, guiding, forgiving, and demanding presence of God. Every one of us does that, every one of us. But guess what? God knows us. God created us. And God forgives us. Most importantly, God forgives us. God doesn't expect us to be perfect. God knows we can't be perfect. God knows we can't follow the law perfectly. That's why we have grace. And that's why we've been saved to the uttermost by faith through grace from Jesus Christ. That brings me to the second part of our scripture that we love our neighbor as ourselves. Now, you might want to say that you don't know me well enough to love me, and you're absolutely right. You don't know me well enough to love me in that sense. But let me assure you that it's fine. I don't know you that well either, but I still love you in the way that Christ talked about because the love that he spoke of has nothing to do with affection. It has to do with how we treat each other how we respond to each other. It has to do with respectful, kind, and compassionate behavior. Treating others the same way we would like to be treated with love and respect. Virtually everyone here wants to be treated with love and respect. And if you don't, then I need to tell you that I can't help you. You've got difficulties that are beyond my scope of ability to help. I can help you find help, but I'm not the one to do it. It means we treat each other with dignity, with respect, even if we don't each understand each other, and even if we don't always agree with one another. I want you to know that I will always do that with you, always. And I expect you to give me the same blessing. I'm never going to yell at you. I'm never going to talk down to you. I'm never going to call you names. And I won't let you do that to me. And I won't let you do that to one another either. Because we're going to 
experience and express the love of God in Jesus Christ with one another and for one another. That's what Jesus Christ calls us to do. Now, will there be times that we feel exasperated with each other? Will there be ever times when we're angry with each other? Maybe. Probably. But if those times do come, all anyone ever has to do is raise their hand and say, can we stop for a minute? Can we pray for a minute? Can we wait for a minute for the Holy Spirit to regain control of this group until order and balance have been restored? That's what our Lord calls us to do. That's what our Lord expects us to do and expects us to be. I want us to do that for Jesus Christ and for one another. John's gospel reminds us that we are not of this world. We may be in the world, but we're not of it. We're not saved to behave the same way as the rest of the world behaves. We're saved to behave as those who have received the gift of salvation, the gift of grace. I know that the political world around us accuses and shouts and argues, treats others badly. I've watched the debates and they've been saddening to my heart. But those values don't define us inside the church. Those values that are practiced by the political world do not define and should not be a part of who we are as disciples of Jesus Christ. We are called to reflect the love we have for God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. To reflect the love that we have for each other in the way that we treat one another inside the church and outside the church all the time. That's a tall order. I understand that. It's not something that all of us are going to be able to do perfectly all the time. In fact, we are not up to the demands of that sort of an order. But guess what? Jesus Christ is. And Jesus Christ lives and reigns in our hearts. Jesus Christ reminds us that we are to treat our neighbors as we would want to be treated, as we love our neighbors, as we love ourselves. Let's remember that. Let's put our trust first and foremost in the one who saves us to the uttermost. If we can, if we can, I'm convinced that everything else, and I mean everything else, will come out exactly as Christ wants it to be. I believe that. My prayer is that you believe that. And beyond that, my prayer is that you will practice that and live that just like I will. Now and every day that God blesses us to live. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we pray that you'll take each and every one of us here and help us to look upon your wonderful face, to see the grace and the peace and the goodness that you have so that we can also reflect it to others, so that we can treat others just like we want to be treated, so that we can love each other and love others as we love ourselves. Help us always to remember that God is first and to keep God first in our hearts, in our souls, and in our minds, always giving thanks that we have been saved through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is in his name that we offer this and all of our prayers. Amen. Please stand. Bless.
attention. I appreciate the, the, the kind glances that you've been able to share back with me today. And I send you out from this place to remember whose you are. You belong to Jesus Christ. You were not your own. You belong to Jesus Christ. So you've been blessed. Now go out of this place and bless somebody else. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.